Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mia No, Director of the Atlantic Council's Asia Security Initiative, housed within the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. I am really delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's panel session on enhancing deterrence in the Taiwan Strait. Today's event is part of our long-running um, cross-strait seminar series that we're proud to be hosting in partnership with the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, TECRO. Today's session provides a critical opportunity for leading experts in Washington to come together to discuss how the United States can take steps to enhance deterrence in the Taiwan Strait in the midst of increasing military and non-military pressure from Beijing. Today's discussion will focus on a series of recent major development in the Taiwan Strait and U.S.-Taiwan relations. And it comes at an especially important time as we continue our effort to develop concrete actionable policy recommendation for a coordinated response to the rise of China with U.S. allies and partners in the Pacific. As a reminder, today's event is open to the public and on the record. Our audience members joining through Zoom can submit their questions at any time using the Q&A function, and there may be time towards the end of the session for me to raise any relevant questions to our panelists. We are very fortunate today to be joined by a fantastic panel with deep expertise on U.S. defense policy, national security, and cross-strait relations. And I'm eager to jump into the discussion to hear their insight into this timely and important topic. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. First, we have Franklin Kramer, Distinguished Fellow and Board Director here at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Kramer has served as a senior political appointee in two administrations, including as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs at the Department of Defense, Mr. Kramer was in charge of the formulation and implementation of international defense and political military policy with worldwide responsibilities, including NATO and Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Mr. Kramer's areas of focus include defense, both conventional and hybrid, irregular conflict and counter insurgency, innovation and national security, and China, including managing competition, military power, and China-Taiwan-US relations. Next, we have Dr. Michael Mazar, who is a senior political scientist at RAND Corporation, where he analyzes US defense policy in the Asia Pacific region, military affairs, and disinformation and information manipulation. Previously, he worked at the US National War College where he was professor and associate dean of academics. He was also president of the Henry L. Stimson Center, senior fellow at um, CSIS, senior defense aide on Capitol Hill, and special assistant to the chairman um, of the Joint Chief of Staff. Finally, we have Mr. Michael Maza, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute AI, who analyzes US defense policy in the Asia Pacific region Chinese military modernization, cross-Taiwan trade relations, and also Korean Peninsula security. He's a regular writer for the AE Ideas blog. He's also the program manager of AI's annual executive program on national security policy and strategy. Okay, so I'd like to kick off today's discussion by asking each of our panelists to offer a few minutes of opening remarks on the topics of today's event. I'd like to start with Mr. Kramer. Frank, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Mignon, and thank you very much for, for having me. I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussion and, and certainly from hearing from my uh, co-panelists. The key point that I want to make, I think the most important takeaway I'll offer this afternoon is that while deterrence obviously has consequential military content and military enhancements are important to deterrence in the strait, in the context of Taiwan, key critical enhancements to deterrence will also include non-military, diplomatic, economic, and digital actions. And let me explain that combination of military and non-military deterrent measures by looking sequentially first at Taiwan, then the United States, <clears throat> and then key US allies. 
and what's in the capacity of each to enhance deterrence. So first, Taiwan. Militarily, Taiwan needs to establish what sometimes is called an effective porcupine defense, uh, a defense that would allow it to defend against an adversary force until support from others would be available. In terms of establishing such a defense, Taiwan actually needs to do better than it has done historically, although it is improving recently. Three key capabilities it needs are anti-ship, air and missile defense, and naval mining. In proper quantities, properly utilized, those capabilities could be key elements of a porcupine defense. But Taiwan also needs non-military measures, and especially to assure that its key critical infrastructures, those that are necessary to military missions, such as the grid, as well as those critical to the population, such as fuel and water and energy, that those critical infrastructures have sufficient cyber and supply chain resilience to operate adequately in the event of a conflict. Now, second, the United States. Militarily, the United States needs to move from the paradigm that served it extremely well for the past 40 years to a new paradigm that involves developing and fielding advanced capabilities such as air and naval autonomous vehicles, contest, conge, excuse me, contested logistical capacities, long-range fires, both kinetic and cyber, and all-domain command and control. That process already has begun. But from my perspective, an even greater emphasis should be included in the FY22 budget and future budgets. The Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff recently underscored these requirements, talking about the need for a new doctrine that he called expanded maneuver. But the US also needs more than military efforts for achieving effective deterrence. The US needs cybersecurity resilience, just as Taiwan does for the key critical infrastructures, for the grid, transportation, and pipelines, those that are necessary to bring forward from the United States to the military and key critical infrastructure supply chains are not inappropriately reliant on China. And a key issue for the U.S., one that it faces, is what might be called the silo problem. DOD relies on critical infrastructure, but it's not in charge of assuring their resilience. The administration has made a good start. For example, the cyber executive order, the pipeline directives, and there are even media reports today that those will be expanded to other critical infrastructures. But there isn't yet a focus on defense outcomes related to key critical infrastructures. A third, the allies. And here, a key deterrent fact would be for allies to make clear that if the U.S. were in conflict with China, allies would support the U.S. And while military support would be critical to the fight, deterrence would actually be most enhanced through non-military means, especially economic. Most specifically, allies should make clear that if the U.S. were in a conflict with China, allies would halt trade with China. In such an event, the U.S. itself, of course, would terminate all trade with China. And it almost certainly would utilize sanctions and like measures to hold others trade. But if allies made clear in advance that they themselves would halt their China trade, that would have a significant impact on China's economy, its rejuvenation, to use that word. Such an approach would have two-way consequences, economic consequences for allies also. And that means that there needs to be an advanced adaptation of supply chains so that reliance on China is significantly reduced. Such economic deterrent steps should be taken not only by the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific allies, but also by its NATO allies, Europe and Canada, who depend critically on U.S. military support for deterrence versus Russia. And those Indo-Pacific allies would also be critical to warfight. And so as deterrent measures, they should undertake to field advanced weapons to ensure cyber and security and supply chain security for critical infrastructures, and to establish with the U.S. combined naval and air capabilities and combined command and control. So to sum up, deterrence can be enhanced. Military measures are obviously critical, but equally key are non-military measures, including the diplomatic, the economic, and the digital measures I've discussed today. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from my co-panelists and the discussion. Thank you so much. That was great uh, opening remarks. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Dr. Mazar. Thanks very much, Mian. It's great to be with you today. 
Um, so in five minutes, I'm going to make five quick points, several of which will actually follow nicely on, on the ideas that Frank Kramer was laying out. I want to stress the beginning of the opinions are my own. We've done a good deal of work on deterrence and some of it regarding Taiwan and Iran, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based on my own research, my own ideas, and it's not uh, should not be associated with the findings of RAND studies necessarily. First point, um, I think it's useful to keep in mind that in our research at RAND on deterrence, the key variable in governing deterrence outcomes is uh, aggressor motivation. How motivated is the aggressor? How urgently do they feel like they have to take action? There's a con constant sort of image of deterrence failure, which amounts to sort of opportunities. When an aggressor sees weakness, they feel like they can jump. And that does happen, but much more often, uh, deterrence fails when a potential aggressor sees an urgent need to act. So for example, Japan in 1941, many senior Japanese leaders didn't think they were gonna win necessarily. They didn't see a particular opportunity, but they thought they had to act. The Soviet Union in 1979 in Afghanistan, the United States in 2003 in Iraq, a lot of cases of states taking military action because they feel like they need to. So a first essential part of deterrence is really a part of the broader goal of dissuasion, which is keeping away from a situation in which China believes that it has no alternative but to act. Because when it reaches that moment, in my view, it becomes essentially undeterrable, no matter how many uh, military systems we've bought in the meantime. Second point, and this relates to some of what Frank was saying, as the United States contemplates its role in deterrence, uh, we have to recognize that U.S. power projection capabilities are significantly challenged and more so than uh, I think uh, any time, certainly since the Cold War. There are so many aspects related to the challenges of the United States getting decisive military capabilities to that region. Uh, in a timely manner to respond to potential aggression, not only the size and capabilities of the force, but as Frank was saying, sustainment, critical infrastructure. Uh, we are now in a world in which the electronic environment of the homeland of the United States would become, uh, would be uh, drawn into chaos in the event of a war to prevent our force flow. There's a lot of things the United States has to do to kind of armor itself and increase the credibility of its force projection as part of deterrence. Third, uh, what we are trying to deter is more than direct aggression. As many folks who have written about this have stressed, um, China has already begun a process of coercion. And as that continues, the next actions they take may not, and I think likely would not be an all out outright invasion of Taiwan, but might include anything from a blockade to si increased cyber harassment, to seizure of the islands uh, in between China and Taiwan. And so as we think about deterrence policies requirements, and responses to potential Chinese actions, we have to be thinking about those intermediate actions as well. They could take some of those actions and kind of flip the deterrent script by taking a partial action and then attempting to deter us from responding or escalating. Fourth, uh, I think in my view, the dominant attention in the United States at least recently has been on what the United States and others like Japan can do to enhance deterrence in the Taiwan Strait. I think we need to flip that emphasis, even the United States, and Frank was talking about this. The dominant focus has to be what Taiwan can do to increase deterrence. It has been doing more, as we know, in terms of defense um, efforts, in terms of the porcupine strategy, the new defense concept they outlined, new, new uh, agreements to, to buy uh, more precision weapons and so on. But in terms of the proportion of GDP spent on defense, in terms of the professionalization and capabilities of their reserve force, in terms of the overall emphasis on their defense procurement on different kinds of weapon systems, I think it is fair to say that Taiwan is nowhere relative to where it needs to be if it takes the risk of aggression as seriously as some senior US military officials appear to. And as an American citizen, um, I would think that our policy on what we might do in the event of aggression has to be partly uh, a function of what we believe that our partner and ally is doing for their own defense. And then fifth and finally, and this also gets to, to Frank's emphasis, there are a lot of options besides the application of military force to both threaten punishment and then impose punishment in the event of conflict other than waging war from the US perspective. Uh, my colleague Patrick Porter and I did a piece on this for the Lowy Institute, uh, kind of a significant report on options for the United States short of going to war in the event of an attack. And Frank has laid out a number of those, economic, diplomatic, informational, 
Um, I think it is important for the United States to have not only a debate about what needs to happen to enhance deterrence in Taiwan, but what our national interests are and what we should be prepared to do in various circumstances. Um, without presupposing what the answer to that is, I fear that the discussion is sliding us into making a de facto decision about committing the nation to certain courses of action before we've really had a full scope debate about the implications of that. So I think there's a lot of ways to support Taiwan strongly in enhancing deterrence and avoiding the outcome that everybody wants uh, to prevent. Um, but there's ways of doing that other than simply redoubling U.S. defense spending and increasing the posture of the U.S. military in the Indo-Pacific. Great, thank you so much. Now, uh, Mr. Maza. Thank you, Dr. O, um, and, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for for inviting me to, to join this this panel. It's a real honor to, to sit on uh, a panel with Mr. Kramer and Dr. Mazar. Um, so, uh, quickly, why don't why don't I just take a quick step back and discuss why. Uh, I, I think we may be heading into more troubled waters in the Taiwan Strait, and, and then I'll get to the sort of the question of the the hour here. Um, so I, I think the intersection of a number of trends makes a Taiwan Strait crisis in the next ten years or so, you know, far more likely than it had been over the last two decades. Uh, and just just very briefly, Xi Jinping appears to be a true believer in the cause of so-called reunification. Um, his inflexibility in dealing with the Thai government in Taipei and his disinterest in winning hearts and minds in Taiwan, uh, both suggest to me that he recognizes peaceful unification is not realistically in the cards. Um, with, with domestic challenges mounting uh, at a time when Xi's leadership is set to extend beyond the two-term norm set by his predecessors, uh, solving the, you know, the, the quote-unquote Taiwan question might be enormously appealing. And if the rapidly modernizing People's Liberation Army begins telling Xi, yes, we can, instead of no, we can't, uh, you know, the temptation to resort to force will only grow. Um, it, it will be an option, uh, a more realistic option, whereas in the past it, it really wasn't. Uh, meanwhile, Taiwan and China are, are separated uh, not just by uh, geography, but by yawning political and societal gaps. And those, those gaps are growing wider. There, there are now three-decade trends in Taiwan of uh, people increasingly identifying as Taiwanese rather than Chinese or, or both Taiwanese and Chinese, and their shrinking support for, for unification and growing support for, for independence. Um, and of course, still overwhelming support for maintaining the status quo. Um, so put, put simply, we may finally get an answer to the question, uh, what happens when an unstoppable force, in this case China, meets an immovable object, Taiwan? Um, but, but of course, we'd rather not find out the answer to that question. Um, so, you know, again, as, as we're discussing today, how do we go about enhancing deterrence in the Taiwan Strait to, to avoid finding, finding out the answer to that question? And I'll offer uh, four points, what I'm calling the ABCDs of enhancing deterrence, and those are uh, arm Taiwan, bolster strategic coherence, counter gray zone coercion, and deepen international interest in Taiwan's fate. Um, and I'll just say a couple of things about each of these. So first, arm Taiwan, um, you know, as, as uh, both of the previous speakers pointed to, there's been plenty of debate about what types of military capabilities Taiwan needs and what the United States should sell. I want to sidestep the specifics of that debate for now and instead suggest, uh, you know, what I think is a significant policy change regarding how the United States provides this kind of support for Taiwan. Um, and, and as my colleague uh, Gary Schmidt and I argued last year in particular, you know, we think it's time to rethink the Pentagon Security Assistance Program for Taiwan. Uh, right now, Taiwan pays for every defense article the United States transfers to it. Uh, but, but going forward, we should consider whether we can use the prospect of military aid as a means to encourage Taiwan to invest more in its own defense, and in particular in, in certain capabilities where they may be underinvested. So you know, ju just one example, uh, Washington could commit that that if Taiwan were to expand its you know, munitions stockpile by some percentage, uh, the U.S. would provide uh, an additional amount uh, via aid. Uh, so second, bolstering strategic coherence. And, and here I think is, is where I'll have a significant disagreement with uh, Dr. Mazar. 
Uh, you know, by this, I mean moving to strategic clarity um, and ensuring that American capabilities align with American intentions and commitments, uh, thus avoiding potentially dangerous uh, strategic insolvency. Given the imbalance of risk in the Taiwan Strait, and at this point it emanates far more from China than it does from Taiwan, and given indications that Beijing may no longer be content to accept an indefinite postponement to unification, I think that deterring Beijing, not Taipei, should be the name of the game. Again, we can we can get more into that during the, the discussion portion if that you know that's of interest. Uh, third, counter gray zone coercion. Now, I, I'm going to admit up front to not having much new to offer here, uh, but I think this is an area that requires far more consideration. And, and again, uh, both of the previous speakers touched on this as well. So, you know, as concerned as I am about potential use of force in the coming years, China is seeking to undermine faith in Taiwan's democratic institutions virtually every day. Um, Taiwan is a main target of hostile PRC cyber operations. Taiwan faces daily military intimidation. Um, the United States can and should do more to help Taiwan resist this type of coercion and deter China from continuing to use these tools so aggressively. Um, and, and in that vein, I think a U.S.-Taiwan free trade agree agreement is, is one potentially helpful tool. It could help dilute Chinese economic leverage vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Um, the U.S. Treasury Department may be able to help Taiwanese authorities uh, track the source of, of dirty money and potentially illegal cam campaign contributions coming from overseas during election season. Um, cooperation in the artificial intelligence intelligence sphere may be useful in countering disinformation and misinformation. Ta Taiwan is doing this already on its own, um, uh, you know. But but I'd argue we should not focus purely on playing defense. Uh, and the question I pose, and and one to which I admittedly don't have an answer, is: Can we make it more costly for China to pressure Taiwan in these in these various ways? Uh, and then fourth and finally, uh, uh, D deepen international interest in Taiwan's fate. You know, put simply, the more countries that have security and economic interests in stability in the Taiwan Strait, the more politically difficult China will find it to take action against Taiwan. Um, I think we should applaud the Biden administration for repeatedly putting the Taiwan Strait on the agenda in bilateral and multilateral settings. I mean, it's good to see other countries at least voicing their concerns. I think Washington should continue to pursue these types of conversations with a wide variety of partners. Um, and, and a U.S.-Taiwan FTA may help too. Uh, in, the, in this way, if it can create space for others to pursue deeper economic ties with Taiwan. Um, and of course, Taiwan can do a lot more to make itself an attractive place for uh, foreign multinational corporations to invest, to do business, um, you know, which would have positive implications, both for the country's prosperity and for its security. Uh, and, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And um I, I think we have a lot to discuss, and I really uh, wanted to thank uh, your really vigorous, sharp analysis in, in, in terms of your suggestions and assessment of how we can enhance it turns um, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, the first question um, that I'd like to ask each of you um, is um, in how to enhance the turns with allies, because all of you, you know, talk about um, you know, cooperation, international cooperation, or how to work with uh, U.S. allies and partners. And Dr. Mazar, you talk about like national interests, national security interests. And I'd like to also note that each country in the Indo-Pacific um, and also even um, allies and partners in Europe, you know, you know, Frank, as you mentioned in terms of NATO, so all of the, all of the, each of the state has different set of, um, you know, priorities when it comes to their national interest. So um, what differences, similarities do you see um, in likely responses, you know, you know, from the regional allies and also, you know, allies and partners from Europe um, and, and, and how should United States and Taiwanese strategy account for the possible uh, different responses from these countries? And to what extent, how far do they have to be prepared for any future crisis? And Frank, would you like to start? Sure, thank you, um, um So let me start actually with Europe for a minute. Um, for a long time, Europe really has uh, avoided the Taiwan question. For a long time, Europe was avoiding the issue presented by China uh, over, I would say, the past two years. Uh, there's been a much more significant set of concerns um, 
with respect to uh, various kinds of Chinese behavior. And I think Europe is finally beginning to recognize that uh, the way the world works now, particularly economically, uh, digitally, and the like, uh, that if something happens in the Indo-Pacific, um, it's going to have high consequences uh, for, for Europe. Um, just as an example, uh, NATO has now put China on the agenda. Uh, the specifics are to be determined, but at least it's there. Uh, likewise, uh, for example, some of the countries, uh, Germany, France, you know, have Indo-Pacific policies, et cetera. So I think uh, what we need to do is to talk to the Europeans both about interest and also about values. And one thing I think we might say out loud is uh, Taiwan is a human rights set of issues as much uh, as some of the other human rights set of issues that uh, China has presented. Because if China took over, uh, you can be fairly certain that Taiwan would no longer be a democracy. Citizens would no longer have uh, the individual rights that they have. So uh, from a values point of view, as well as from an interest point of view, um, I think that uh, Europe has a great set of interests and, and that ought to be a, a basis for activity. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific itself, of course, we've seen uh, some very helpful statements from my perspective uh, by Japan, um, recognizing you know, the importance of, uh, I think the phrase is stability in the Taiwan Straits, but more recently even going further, uh, likewise with respect to Australia. And again, I think uh, uh, what one needs to do is to um, create the structural circumstance so that it wouldn't be so devastating uh, if Japan or Australia, or for that matter, Republic of Korea, um, had to uh, look at China as an adversary in the context of a, of a Taiwan situation. So as I said earlier, I think it's tremendously important to uh, establish uh, for those countries uh, cybersecurity and uh, a, re a reduction, not, not a, a complete dissolution, um, not a total decoupling, but a reduction in reliance on China. Um, I won't get into it in any detail, but I've talked about a China what plus one type approach, basically meaning that supply chain should have at least one country other than China uh, that they can rely on. So let me stop there, Miel. Thank you, um, Dr. Mazar. Would you like to? Um... Sure, I'll I'll uh, distinguish between um, sort of military and non-military roles. Um, on the military side, the great challenge is, um, and my colleague Bonnie Lynn has published some RAND work on this, along with with other RAND folks. She's testified on it. Um, there's been a fair amount of work looking at the perspectives of other countries in the region on the potential conflict specifically in Taiwan. And I think it's fair to say that the bottom line message of that is that no other country in the region really wants anything to do with that kind of a war. Japan, as you say, has been doing some more significant signaling in the last really few weeks on this question. Um, but that signaling is still limited in terms of taking this sort of thing very seriously as well. I mean, even the United States, of course, does not have, uh, as Mike was indicating, an ironclad guarantee to go to war, and Japan certainly has not indicated that. But apart from Japan, one of the great problems from the United States looking at this as a military um, contingency is that um, if we're going to try to project power into that conflict from the United States or Guam uh, without any basing access, sustainment, you know, uh, support from countries closer, it's going to be extremely difficult. And both because of a general fact that their interests are not at stake as much and because of what China would threaten to do to them, I think we're going to have great trouble getting others actively involved in the military campaign. And that's something we have to keep in mind before we make commitments or, or promises. On the non-military side, I actually agree very much. I agree, in fact, with three of Mike's four uh, ABCD points, and we only really disagree on the the, the unconditional commitment in the military piece, I think his D, deepening connections, is, is very important. Patrick and I recommended that in our piece. And I think that part of what that involves is a multilateral effort to signal to Beijing that its effort to isolate and somehow create a veil of um, illegitimacy around Taiwan will not be accepted by the outside world, and that we will increase economic, cultural, political, other kinds of ties that stop well short of the kind of direct military promises or role 
that, for example, in uh, the communiques, the United States has placed limits on that China would feel as an, a more immediate challenge to their one China policy. But lots of different ways of signaling that the world considers Taiwan to be a valued member of the democratic community and that any hostile action, including, and I agree also with Mike, the current uh, gray zone activities, um, will promote significant criticism. And they, in the event of large scale conflict, there would be really serious consequences. One of the things that we find from our work on deterrence is that one of those variables that is associated with successful deterrence is high levels of non-military engagement between the deterring country and the target country. So um, if, if there's a target country that the United States has no real relations with, our deterrent threat is gonna be less credible than if we have stronger economic ties, uh, if we have cultural visits all the time, strong student connections, right? If you have thousands and thousands of European students studying in Taiwan at any one time, the prospect of military action for China is just different. So I think that you've got these two very different portraits. On the non-military side, I think there's a lot that we can do multilaterally to, to, to both increase engagement with Taiwan and to signal that there would be, uh, as U.S. officials have said, catastrophic consequences, economic, political, and otherwise for China, potentially military, uh, if it were to take this kind of aggressive action. On the military side, I think it's trying to develop any sort of coalition arrangement where we all promise to go to war. I think that's a non-starter. Thank you. And um, Mr. Maza, so would you like to share your um, thought on my question? And also, I, I think you might also want to follow up with um, just Dr. Mazar's point on unconventional military commitment, because you said that you'd like to, you know, spend more time later, you know, during your opening at your opening remarks, right? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start on your question. I'm going to kind of pick up where, where uh, Dr. Mazar left off. Um, so look, I, I, I think I think he is, I, I agree with him that uh, at this point in time, we can't, um, we can't count on, on U.S. allies being there in a Taiwan fight. Now, I, you know, I think that that can change. And right? so I'd make a couple of points. I think, I, I think it's debatable that U.S. interests in Taiwan's uh, continuing de facto independence are uh, greater than Japan's, right? I mean, J J Japan presumably has has more direct interest in that. It, it, it's in the neighborhood and that that creates um, significant security complications for Japan were were Taiwan ever to be uh, occupied, annexed, uh, and and so Japan cares deeply about this. Um, obviously, it has you know con conflicting instincts when it comes to the, this question. Uh, I, I think the there's similar is true to a you know a lesser extent when it comes to Australia. And I think what we need to be be doing now is is starting to have these really uh, difficult conversations with with U.S. allies about you know what American expectations might be in the event of a conflict. Um, you know what Japan and Australia think their reactions might be. Uh, we don't want to be surprising each other when um, when the crisis hits. And, and I think if we begin these conversations now, uh, over time, we may be able to at least bring those two allies a little bit closer to where we we stand and, and ex, you know expect reasonably expect some more assistance from them. Um, you know, the other point I'd make here is is China may sort of do the hard work for us, right? they're They're pushing everybody away. Um, countries around the world are are not raising concerns about the Taiwan Strait because the United States is suddenly banging on the drum, but but because, um, you know, China on a daily basis is, is sending airplanes up into the, the skies around Taiwan and, and adopting a very uncompromising approach. Um, it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. You know, so on, on the question of strategic clarity, whether the United States should make a firm commitment to, to Taiwan's Defense, you know, I, I essentially believe that we we can do that. I should do that. Um, it, it, I don't want to give the impression that I don't recognize this is, uh, you know, this is a an immensely complicated question. Um, and I think that the arguments against against doing so, against taking that step, are are you know, many of them are quite quite thoughtful. Uh, Dr. Mazars included. Um, 
All right, but I, you know, as I kind of laid out in my initial remarks, I, I no longer see the security threat as a sort of long-term potential problem. Um, I hope it remains that way, but I think it, the threat is growing more urgent. Um, and, and I think sort of the the old ways of dealing with that threat uh, are, are not going to to work in the way they have in past decades. Um, I, you know, I think there's a way to to doing this with without giving Taiwan you know, you know, uh, free reign to uh, pursue formal independence. Um, I think we can can make this conditional. Um, although that you know that that's a hard thing to do. You know, the, the last thing I point out though on that that question is that you know e even if we talk about a scenario in which Taiwan is you know supposedly supposedly provoking Beijing, it will always be Beijing that is opting. For violence, right? It, it, it's very difficult to imagine a scenario in which Taiwan initiates hostilities. Um, and, and so, while I agree we don't want to encourage Taiwan to take potentially provocative steps, Beijing needs to remain the target of, of deterrent efforts. And I and I think being clear about the challenges China will face, um, you know. It creates a more stable situation over the longer term in the Taiwan Strait. Thank you. And um, I know that we, you know, have spent, um, you know, we have, I heard a lot from all of you about non-military um, deterrence. Um, and i like to just ask one more question um, related to that, which is about democracy, because I think this is an uh, important topic. So first with uh, Mr. Kramer, last month you co-authored a report titled Transformative Priorities for um, National Defense. And, and as part of the discussion um, of the Indo-Pacific in that report, you argue that both security interests in the Indo-Pacific and democratic values worldwide would be undercut by a failure to maintain Taiwan's freedom. And you know, we know that the Biden administration, um, it, this is a very important organizing principle, principle and, and he wrote um, during his presidential campaign and foreign affairs article that he, he he's going to host, he will host Summit for Democracy um, later. And as far as I understand, Taiwan would like to join that group and also play a role. So, um, um, can you please um, elaborate on your point of why you see a threat to Taiwan um, as a threat to democracy worldwide? And, and, and then I'd like to hear from others too. Sure, Mion. So uh, first of all, um, you know, over the past several decades, uh, Taiwan has become a, a full-fledged democracy. Um, and it deserves enormous credit uh, for that. Um, I think that uh, as a, I, I, not that the president's asking me, but uh, I, I fully agree with the uh, idea that part of American foreign policy ought to be support for democracy. Um, and Taiwan has demonstrated its ability to, to be democratic. Um, if we mean at least what I say, which is to say democracy is part of the American ethos. Uh, it's important for us to support um, democracy throughout the world, then I think we should take that into account with respect to Taiwan. I don't think we have to change uh, the way we state our position on Taiwan. Um, the Taiwan Relations Act and then the subsequent uh, statements uh, by by presidents and also by secretaries of state, most recently, for example, by uh, Secretary Blinken, um, make pretty clear, I think, that we care a great deal about uh, Taiwan being able to maintain its current status and that there shouldn't be a change in status uh, other than by negotiation, if any, uh, and and no, uh, no use of means other than peaceful means. Um, but I do think that if we care about we say we care about democracy worldwide, and we don't take steps to support a democracy that's you know potentially attacked, um, or as has been pointed out, uh, undergoing uh, I'll use the word gray zone or hybrid uh, sets of activities against it. Uh, we wouldn't really be true to our principles. Now we 
always have to take into account the uh, degree of harm that might be caused by adhering to uh, uh, the principle without evaluating the context. Um, but I do think that uh, it's important, and I think it's important to discuss with the American people um, whether or not uh, supporting democracy in this instance uh, is something American people want to do. Uh, that means, of course, in the first instance, talking with the Congress, um, where, of course, there's a great deal of support for Taiwan. Um, I also want to step back and say, uh, with respect to uh, allies, because I don't agree at all that allies wouldn't be supportive uh, in the event of a conflict. If there was a conflict with China, it's not very likely to be contained. Um, and if there's a conflict with China that the United States loses, the consequences for deterrence, um, both in the Indo-Pacific uh, with respect to Japan uh, and Australia, um, or in Europe, I think would be uh, quite significant, uh, both because what would be the thinking here in the United States, and I think uh, those countries would be thinking, hmm, the United States lost, you know, how, how certain can we be about deterrence? But if those countries supported the U.S., then I think the chances of uh, prevailing would be uh, significantly higher. So, yeah, I've seen uh, in the past uh, the same set of uh, conversations about, well, um, countries in the region would be nervous about supporting the U.S. I think that has substantially changed over the past few years, uh, especially in light of the uh, Chinese Communist Party and, and, and in particular, President Xi's approach. Um, so let me stop there, Miel. You're muted. muted. Sorry. So Dr. Mazar, so what, what opportunities and challenges do you see um, Taiwan's democratic status, you know, would create to enhance deterrence in your yep. view? So yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, respectfully disagree on two points with Frank Kramer. Um, one is that last one. I think there's, um, you know, having looked at uh, a, a lot of uh, sources of evidence, I think there's a lot, there's abundant evidence that uh, most of the countries in the region are, are not in a position, when we talk about support, it depends on what we mean by support, right? And, and so there could be verbal support, there could be sort of quiet uh, allowance of U.S. use of airspace or things like that. But if we're talking about U.S. military operations conducted from countries who would then invite Chinese missile attacks and other things on themselves, that's that's a big bridge to cross. And I just, I don't see that happening in most places. Um, I also disagree that um, democracy is something that we should be prepared to use military forces to intervene and promote or fight wars and defend. Um, I think it is a very important value for the United States and there are a lot of means we can use to promote it. Um, but I think our history suggests that those times when we make democracy promotion a military mission uh, are some of the times when we've gone wrong. I particularly believe that worldwide democracy is not an interlinked um, sort of organism that uh, its failure in one place will cause failures in other in others. I don't see any reason to believe, I mean, unless uh, Taiwan is the first step to a Chinese conquest of all the democracies in Asia, that um, if something were to happen with Taiwan, that it would threaten uh, Japan's democracy or Indonesia's democracy or others. There obviously are, you know, destabilizing effects of an act like that, and we should try to deter it. Um, but I just personally don't believe that the United States has either a moral obligation or a strategic imperative to employ its forcible national power to ensure a certain level of democracy in the world. Uh, as I say, we, there, there are a hundred things we can be doing to, to promote democracy around the world um, in gradual, peaceful ways, working with established democracies that are beleaguered, uh, helping with um, democratic institution building, a lot of things we can do. Um, but I just, and, and it's not about Taiwan, it's about any country. I would never see the protection of democracy as the reason why the United States should fight for a particular country. If we make a strategic decision, that would be different. Thank you, um, Mr. Maza. I'm sure you'd like to respond. And also, Frank, please let me know if you'd like to um, just respond to um, what you just heard from Dr. Mazar. So, Mr. Meza, Maza, 
Your turn. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think, uh, so, you know, I, I tend to agree with with Mr. Kramer on on the importance of um, ensuring that that China is is not able to you know swallow democracy uh, because it decides it wants to do that. Um, but but more more broadly speaking, I think Taiwan's democracy is is an enormous strength of its own in um, you know in, in defending itself, right? So you know, because it's a democracy. It, because it's a, a, a you know thriving rambunctious democracy, it has this story that is enormously appealing to people around the world, especially in other uh, democratic countries, but but in in non democratic countries as well that uh, you know may may aspire to follow um, follow Taiwan's paths. So you know it, it's certainly a a tool um, that Taiwan can use to deepen its partnerships around the world. Um, and, and I think that it, it should not be shy in doing so. Thank you. Thank you know, if I could just yep. say one short point. Sure. Uh, this uh, with the, the democracy issue with respect to Taiwan is not democracy promotion um, in the sense that, uh, for example, the George W. Bush administration talked about it. It would it's defense of a democratic entity. Um, and to say that the United States doesn't do things to defend democracy, that's the fundamental reason, or, or at least one of the fundamental reasons why we have NATO. Um, so I just think that, uh, I just flat out disagree. I also think that if we one doesn't take into account uh, military capabilities uh, to help defend Taiwan, um, you provide, there's a, there's a, a slogan, so to speak, uh, that I heard when I used to work at the Pentagon, and it was, well, they'll provide all assistance short of actual help. And I think that providing, not, not including the military part of defending Taiwan uh, amounts to providing all assistance short of actual help. Thank you. We have some great um, audience questions. Um, so I'd like to take one um, from, um, from, from them. So question from uh, Walt Slocum, um, who is our board director and former U.S. Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. His question is, should the United States be explicit that we will respond to repel an attack from China? How do we convince the U.S. public to back that commitment? Who would you like to start? I'll, I'll start because Walt was my boss at the Pentagon, so I, I, I need to know what his answer is so I can agree. But um, so I, I think that the current way that we, uh, the U.S. and the current administration describes things uh, is, is fine. I think that we have... Uh, demonstrated um, an enhanced interest uh, through a variety of different activities, uh, some of which are symbolic, such as the invitation uh, to the Taiwan representative at the inauguration, uh, the senators that went there, et cetera. I think that we ought to uh, work closely on issues like trade uh, to be determined the precise way. Um, and I think that um, ensuring uh, as I said, uh, that Taiwan has the military capabilities uh, for what I call the port to find defense um, would also be important. Um, the reason not to be explicit is to avoid causing China to think that it has to, it has to take action now. Um, and that's a judgment as to whether or not that uh, change in wording um, and, and change in approach uh, caused that. But I think there's the risks and no, no high benefit. Uh, then with respect to the American people, which uh, I couldn't agree more, uh, the United States should not go to war unless the American people supported it. I think that uh, we should include in the uh, significant discussions that are going on in this country uh, with respect to China, uh, explicit discussions uh, make Taiwan part of that discussion. I already mentioned uh, Congress. I, I was in a 
executive branch person, but I have enormous uh, respect for the role of the Congress in these kinds of things. And I think the administration and the Congress needs to spend a lot of time together, you know, the usual hearings uh, and the like, uh, to make sure that the American people are aware. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mazar. Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree basically with everything Frank Kramer just said. I, I think it would be a real mistake. You know, the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, testified that China would view an explicit promise as extremely, extremely escalatory. And as I say, one of my concerns is that history suggests that unless, you know, um, we are prepared to do a huge amount militarily to, to change the situation on the ground, that promise alone, if China gets to the point of believing it needs to attack, might not make the difference. I think it's important to keep in mind, and Patrick and I tried to argue this in our piece, that this is a nuclear armed power we're talking about. And as is being discussed these days, it's going to be a bigger nuclear armed power. Um, if the United States goes to war for Taiwan, it may well be the most destructive war the United States has ever fought, significantly more so than World War II. Absolutely catastrophically destructive for the United States military and potentially for the American people. As Frank Kramer said, we before we slide into making that commitment by default, as we did, I would suggest, in Vietnam, in many ways, we need to have a big public debate about that level of national commitment. Mr. Maza? Yeah, so look, I, 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 I agree and disagree with parts of what have been said. I, I certainly agree that, you know, you know the, the US public needs to be uh, engaged in this in discussion. Um, and, and set aside the question about whether you move to clarity or not, it, having that d discussion, um, you know, if, if U.S. officials, um, if, if uh, representatives, senators are making the case of the American people about Taiwan's importance and, and about the importance of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, again, regardless of, of, of whether or not we're talking about a, a firm commitment um, to intervene in a conflict, that in itself can contribute to deterrence, right? You are... Um, in in having that conversation, you're signaling to China your seriousness about about your concerns uh, with with what's happening in in the region, um, and, and you know to the extent that uh, the American people sort of accept those arguments, again you're you're enhancing deterrence by by um, by making it more likely uh, that 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 uh, that China sees the American people not as a sort of a barrier to, to intervening or coming to Taiwan's aid um, in, in the event that, that China decides to use force. Um, uh, I, I agree with Mr. Kramer's point, um, or I think it's, a, it's certainly a valid argument, right? That uh, a, a movement or a, a decision to clarify our commitment to defend Taiwan, or to make that much firmer, um, may actually convince the Chinese that that they they can only solve this problem by force, right? That um, um, that if if the United States makes a commitment like that, Taiwan will have never have any reason to submit to coercion short, short of short of force, um, and that's that's actually the only option remaining to China. I, I you know I, I find that to be a compelling argument. Um, you know, the counter argument for me is that I think China has already given up on, on peaceful unification. I think it, it recognizes that it, it cannot achieve unification without, um, you know, substantial coercion, if not outright force. And, I, you know, I think there's good reason to recognize or think that you know, coercion short of force would fail um, and that they're not willing to put this off again indefinitely anymore. Um, and again, that that's sort of the basic reason why I come down on the side of clarifying that commitment. Uh, again, to, to Dr. Mazar's point, you know, we're talking about two nuclear armed powers, right? And, 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 the, and the point of moving to clarity is is to avoid a conflict, not not because, you know, eager to get into one. Um, and, and so I'm, and personally, I'm by no means, you know, wedded to this, this argument, but I, I come down on the side of, it reducing the chances of conflict rather than, than increasing them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take one more question from the audience um, before we wrap up, which is like, which I think very relevant. 
So would a formal U.S. This is a question from Chris Prebel. Um, would a formal U.S. commitment to come to Taiwan's defense require a treaty ratify, ratified by the Senate? Or should the president be able to fulfill this obligation solely on his or her authority? Frank, would you like to start? Sure. Um, well, it's actually a third, uh, third way, and it's called the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, so the Congress has provided uh, specific language. I don't have it exactly in front of me, right? Well, I don't have it in front of me, so and I don't exactly remember it. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, a treaty is... Um, U.S. states went to, um, you know, created an international coalition, et cetera, you know, totally different circumstances. Um, I was trying to remember, I'm pretty sure there was a, a congressional resolution. Um, and so I don't think anyone uh, needs to, uh, so I don't think tree is necessary. Uh, I do think that if you're going to war, uh, particularly with China, that the Congress should be uh, involved, um, could be by uh, congressional resolution, which I think would be, you know, again, we're making up the circumstances, but I think that would probably be the way to go. Um, I certainly don't think that, uh, you know, not assuming that our forces weren't attacked, uh, assuming that there wasn't. For example, we do have a treaty uh, with respect to Japan and with respect to Australia. If, if Japan was attacked, you know, as part of a Chinese uh, attack uh, with respect to Taiwan, we we do have a treaty obligation with respect to Japan. Um, but I don't think that one needs a, a treaty in order to have an entirely appropriate way, both from a technical legal point of view and more importantly from a political point of view, by which I mean engaging the American people in order to uh, provide a defense. Thank you, Dr. Mazar. So uh, thanks, Chris, for that great question. Um, just quickly, um, I, I, I think as a strong supporter of the idea, the new bipartisan proposals to have a stronger congressional voice in going to war, I think if we were going to make a, a promise in advance to go to war, it absolutely should be a congressional action. However, something like that raises exactly the problem we talked about earlier, because if you enter into a congressional debate that could end with a treaty um, committing the United States to Taiwan, uh, almost certainly during that process, China will publicly and privately indicate that if that begins to happen, um, this could be a reason for them to take uh, more uh, precipitate action. Um, and th that would significantly complicate the debate. So I think in practice, if it were to happen, um, not that I favor it, but a safer way actually might be for everybody to wake up one day and find out that the president had issued a public statement and there were now U.S. troops on Taiwan. And now that president's going to go to the Congress and, and get support for that uh, to kind of prevent that, that period of danger. Uh, I don't think that would be wise for a democracy. Um, but the congressional debate route has a lot of risks. Thank you, Mr. Maza. Yeah, look, it's a it's a great question, and there's not an easy answer here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think a treaty. So, look, if we are um, remain committed to one China policy, even if it's one we're kind of shifting our definition of, I think you know that that's a good reason to go the the treaty route, or not to go the treaty route. Um, uh, and, and perhaps this is what what Mr. Kramer was getting at. But you know, in 1955, there was the Formosa Resolution where Congress essentially pre-authorized Eisenhower to to use force during the first Taiwan Strait crisis. You know, it's a model. Um, and I think it was the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act that was introduced last year by a congressman whose whose name is escaping me at the moment, which sought to do something akin to this. Certainly agree that Congress needs to be involved uh, in these sorts of discussions. Um, what the actual mechanics are, I'm not quite sure. Thank 
Great. Um, so it's um, time to wrap up and thank you um, all of our distinguished panelists for their uh, for and your great exceptional insight analysis offered as part of today's discussion in our cross phase years. I think I really think that this is a unique opportunity to have so much expertise on one, one panel and this is such a tiny important um, topic. So um, I please um, stay tuned for more from the Asia Security Initiative um, and, and our work on Taiwan. And I really look forward to um, engaging uh, more with you moving forward. And we hope to see you again at events hosted by the Atlantic Council in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.